This morning's gospel comes from the 10th chapter of John, the first 10 verses. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way as a thief and a bandit, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now you have to remember, even though I lived for 23 years in West Virginia, I am a suburban Baltimore County girl at heart. I don't know livestock. I know dogs and cats and parakeets, but livestock is a little bit beyond my realm of experience. So when I was in West Virginia, I was surrounded by animals all the time, and especially fields full of sheep. When you're a pastor, you're sort of drawn to the sheep image because the scriptures are filled with images of sheep. Us as the sheep, Jesus as the lamb, Jesus as the shepherd. And so in 2014 for Advent, the Baltimore Washington Conference Communications Commission asked me to prepare an Advent devotional for 26 days of lessons. And they asked me to write a prayer for each one based on words that we had come up together with during annual conference that year, words that we wrote on little bridges to talk about our unity with one another. And for these 26 words, I was asked to come up with a scripture lesson, a devotional, a prayer, and one of my original photographs. One of them was going to be of a sheep, and I thought this couldn't be any easier. So I went down the road where, just about a mile and a half from my house, was a huge field of sheep. I have a very long telephoto lens, and I was there getting ready to take a picture because they didn't come very close to me, and I was between the road and the fence and the field of sheep. And just as I was ready to snap the picture, along came a pickup truck full of teenage boys who decided when they got close to me that they were going to lay on the horn and scream. And the sheep tore off, and I almost fell on my behind in the mud. Well, I went out looking for another field of sheep, found that one, and as soon as I got close, they tore off. Reminded me of just a few years earlier when my youth group had made a film for Christmas. They were filming the story, and we were in a barn with cows, and then we were in a field full of sheep. And even though the woman who owned the sheep were, was there with us, they would not come close, and they were not exactly good on taking cues. As soon as the shepherds were supposed to get close to the sheep, Buford, the head sheep, I did not know that sheep have sort of elected officials, but Buford, the head sheep, tore off and everyone followed him. Into the woods, down a hill, rolling in the dirt, wherever Buford went, they followed. And so, as I continued to try to find pictures of sheep, I finally went on Facebook and said, please, all my urban and suburban friends, ignore this. I need a sheep. I need an up-close and personal picture of a sheep. To which my urban and suburban friends said, you have been in West Virginia too long. And some of them said, why don't you just Google a sheep image? But I needed an original picture, and someone from my congregation sent me a message that said, call my grandson because his cousins have sheep. And so I called him up, and he called his cousins, who were in 4-H, and I went to the field of sheep. This is the photograph I took. This is Miss Paisley. She is really a beauty. Miss Paisley did not run, because all we needed to do was to call, to have her owner, her shepherdess, call, and Paisley came running. Reminded me immediately of the story that we read this morning. My sheep know my voice, and they come to me. I have to understand that in the ninth chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus has healed a man born blind who could only listen for his voice. He didn't know what he looked like. He couldn't see him until he was healed. We remember on Easter morning how Jesus spoke Mary's name 
outside the tomb and she recognized him. And how, although they were kept from recognizing him on the road to Emmaus, when they broke bread with him and they felt their hearts stirred within him at the sound of his voice, they finally recognized him. That is a good image, just as the image of sheep is a good one for us. Now, the picture of Miss Paisley looks pretty good, doesn't it? She's all spiffed up. She does not look like that, really. That was about an hour of Photoshop. She had stuff coming out of her nose and her ears and her mouth. Her wool was not soft and fluffy like the picture that we get in our mind of a lamb. Her wool was filled with burrs and pieces of twig and dirt and rocks and everything else that she had picked up along the way because she certainly did need a shepherd to care for her. We all need a shepherd to care for us because, as the epistle lesson said, we all, like sheep, have gone astray until we are called and returned to the shepherd and the guardian of our souls. Being with sheep the way I have leads me to think they don't just run astray, they run amok. They're going in every direction at one time. They will follow whoever the leader is, regardless of where that leader is taking them, until they hear the voice of the shepherd. And that is when they come to themselves and they follow. That's what we're called to do as Christ's disciples. We are called to listen for the voice above all others. There are so many voices crying out to us to do so many things that will lead us in so many directions that will take us far from Christ. But he is the true gate, the door, the open door, not a door that closes against others, not a door meant to keep people out, but a door meant to usher us in by the right way to the place where God would have us be. We're living in a very difficult time, I know, and that's why we need to look a little bit about the epistle lesson this morning and its understanding of suffering, what suffering meant and what suffering does not mean. The suffering that we're talking about in the first epistle of Peter is suffering for the sake of righteousness, suffering for the sake of the gospel, suffering to stand up for Jesus Christ. Jesus does not want us to suffer randomly or intentionally, as some people have done before, to beat themselves to feel closer to God. The suffering is standing up for who Christ is in the world. It is certainly not, and please hear this, any sort of defense or commendation of slavery, which it was used as even in our own nation in the 19th century during the time of the Civil War. What the writer is telling us to do is to remember who we are in light of Jesus Christ and to follow him at all costs. So don't think about those slaveholders who said that God wants you to be happy where you are and to suffer for righteousness sake. No, in the time that this was written, slaves were forced sometimes to worship the gods of the household, the slave owner, and they would refuse to do so and they would be beaten for that. That's the kind of suffering we're talking about and certainly not the suffering for those who are ill, those who have cancer, those who are suffering from COVID because this is not the will of God. The will of God is wholeness, because Christ came that we might have life and have it abundantly. Now, I had another experience with a sheep in church. Now, you have to remember, I'm from the suburbs, so I would always call the Lang family, a shout out to the Langs of Hedgesville, West Virginia. I would call them because they were involved in 4-H, and their son Daniel, I met when he was a very young child and was able just a few years ago to officiate at his wedding. So Daniel and I go way back. Daniel's a good sport. In 4-H and in his life, he likes to raise milk cows. But upon occasion, I would call him up and say, Daniel, can you find me a donkey? And then Daniel, would you mind dressing like Jesus and riding the donkey through the streets of Hedgesville for Palm Sunday morning? He was a very good sport. His father said to me, one of these days later, you're going to have to get this lectionary of yours to match up with the real seasons of animals because there are no lambs at Christmas time for the manger. And I had always had a hard time for a live nativity coming up with a sheep because the sheep were mostly 4-H projects, the ones that were very portable, the ones that were used to being around people up close and personal. And most of the time they were expecting lambs. Lambs are born in late winter and very early spring. But I had the great idea that for a children's sermon on Good Shepherd Sunday, which that year fell in May, as it does this year, that I wanted a lamb. Now, you have to understand, lambs grow very quickly. And so Daniel, my old pal, comes in with a lamb. He has it around the legs. Daniel was a big guy. He was a farm kid. 
He was holding on to this lamb with all his might, and the lamb was nice and quiet until it turned around and it saw the congregation looking at it and went, Mah! I'm telling you, people fell off their pews. We had to take the poor thing outside because lambs are very vulnerable. They are very defenseless, except when they have the shepherd close by. One of the things that has broken my heart in these days of the pandemic and our response to it are the people who are protesting at state houses with guns often, wanting things to reopen. I want things to reopen too. I miss you all so desperately. I miss sharing communion with you. I cannot tell you how hard it is to be a shepherd, which is the definition of pastor, without a flock. But the thing that broke my heart the most was at one of the protests, someone holding up a sign that said, sacrifice the weak. Because for some folks, the idea of opening up businesses and opening up the community fully, opening schools, opening churches, if that means that the older or more vulnerable people will die of the coronavirus, so be it. That is antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ as it has been revealed and opened in my heart. Because Christ, who was the lamb without blemish, who was without sin, came and took upon himself in his vulnerability the sins of the world, the sins of me and you and the whole world. He took them upon himself so that he might be raised to new life and abundant life. He said, the meek shall inherit the earth. He never said, sacrifice the weak. But he laid down his life so that we might have life abundant in this world and life eternal in the world to come. So as we wait these weeks out, as we wait to see what happens next, as we pray together for the curve to flatten, for people to rest be restored to health, for our community to be restored, as we wait to see if it means that we'll be worshiping with masks for a while or spread out in the pews, it might be a long time before we have a potluck supper or we're able to shake hands again. But until then, we trust in the shepherd Listen for his voice above all others because he has come to give us abundant life. It's not always what we hope it will be. It's not always without pain or trial. But in our suffering, though Christ does not call us to a life of suffering, in suffering we meet him in an intimate way because God is never closer to us than when we cry out in need. So this morning, as we sing together, O oh Jesus, I have promised... O oh, speak and make me listen, thou guardian of my soul. Know that the voice of God is whispering all around us if we just would listen. <laughs>